higher probability. <clears throat> so that's in contrast to what we might call something like strict determinism, which is basically this idea. So I have a pen in my hand, right? It falls. I could do this over and over again, right? It's going to fall every time. That's basically the idea of determinism, simply put. Compared with probability, let's say I did this four times, and the fourth time it magically floats or something like that. So it's more likely that it's going to fall and go to the ground, but it's not guaranteed, basically. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. All right. So now we're going to get into those causation criteria. How do we ultimately know if an independent variable has a causal relationship with a dependent variable? Now I've mentioned some mnemonic devices before, so I like them. They can be helpful uh, for remembering things. So of course I have one here, a little bit silly, but race to New Mexico's capital. Race to New Mexico's capital. And each of those kind of corresponds to one of these criteria, as well as relevant conditions we also have to consider. So the first one, race, that corresponds to relationship, association, correlation. All those words mean the same thing. Uh, two is temporal order. Temporal is just a fancy word for time. So time, order. The new corresponds to non-spurious. Spurious is another one of those kind of fancy words. It basically means false. So we're basically saying not a false relationship. With Mexico's, that's when we get into mechanism, excuse me, and capital is context. So we're going to go through each one of those, but that's just a quick thing. If you remember race to New Mexico's capital, then you can remember all these specific things. So the first one, relationship, association, correlation. The idea here is that the independent variable should be correlated with the dependent variable. Again, like I mentioned when we talked about nomothetic causal explanations, independent variable changes dependent variable changes. So, example I have here, as people age, the likelihood that they are going to engage in criminal behavior also changes. So age would be our independent variable. Likelihood of criminal behavior would be our dependent variable. As age changes, likelihood of criminal behavior also changes. Now, I think I mentioned this before. If you've ever heard someone say something like, correlation does not equal causation. You might have heard that kind of thing before. And although that is true, it's important to note that correlation is a necessary condition of causation. If there's no correlation, there's no causal relationship. So just a little kind of brief point with that, we do need to see a correlation if there's a causal relationship. It's not the only thing we need to see, but it's one necessary thing we need to see. Next one, in time order, you don't have to worry about remembering temporal, that word is time order. <clears throat> Key idea here, independent variable changes first, Dependent variable changes second. Kind of like uh, if you're the people say chicken or the egg type thing, which comes first. Kind of same idea here. One has to come before the other if there's a causal relationship. So <clears throat> the example I have here, say we're doing uh, like a program evaluation, and as part of that, we have this group of people that are going to be starting on parole. We assign one group of them to this new treatment program, and then the other group gets traditional parole. We basically track them for a year, 
and then we compare the two groups on um, recidivism. So whether or not uh, they committed some violation or new offense in that 12 month period. So the condition they were in, whether they got the treatment program, whether they got traditional parole, we did that first, right? So that's the independent variable. We did that first. 12 months later, we're then looking at recidivism. Again, just key idea. There being independent variable, that's what happened first. Dependent variable changes were seconds. With me so far, should be correlated. One should happen before the other. <clears throat> now, this third one can be a little bit confusing. <clears throat> non spuriousness. Again, spurious, fancy word for basically saying false, so we don't want to have a false relationship. Uh, the general term I like to use, and I think it's a little bit more clear with this. Sometimes called the third variable problem. The idea is that our relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable should not be explained by some third variable, some other variable. So this first example I have uh, up here in this diagram, this would be a spurious relationship. So we have a relationship between the independent variable and dependent variable, but you see this one in red, that's predicting the independent variable as well as the dependent variable. So the third variable here is explaining that relationship. One notable example within criminal justice, criminology. Uh, we've talked a little bit about broken windows theory before, right? Basically the idea, places have more disorder, there's more likely to be crime there. Lower disorder, less likely to have crime. So basically this potential causal relationship between disorder and crime. Well, there was uh, some researchers that came along and basically made, did some research and made the argument that that relationship was basically a spurious relationship, a false relationship. And that actually that relationship was explained by what they call collective efficacy. Um, basic idea, you can think about it at the neighborhood level, if there's lots of a high degree of collective efficacy, it basically means that people know each other, uh, people kind of look out for each other, um, they can kind of come together as a community to solve problems in the neighborhood, that kind of thing. So that's what they showed in that study. So relationship between disorder, crime, they argued was spurious, it's actually explained by this thing they call collective efficacy, which explained disorder and also explained crime. Yes? And then the third variable does show the relationship. It explains. So the third variable explains both. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the third variable is going to explain both. But it should. Yes, correct. If there is a true causal relationship, that shouldn't be explained by some other variable. So in this case, yeah, the third variable is explaining disorder, it's also explaining crime. So that disorder-crime relationship would be spurious or false. Making sense? Again, I know that's a little bit, a little bit tough to understand. Um, <clears throat> but again, Main thing you can think about, and in terms of stuff for like your final written assi assignment for the studies you're looking at, that's kind of what you want to think about. Is there some other variable that might explain these findings, more or less? <clears throat> All right, the next two things we're going to talk about, these are not 
necessarily a formal criteria of causation, but they are still relevant. So this first one, mechanism. The mechanism explains why there is a relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. I like to think about it as like some machine or like calculator, right? We have an input, then we have mechanism, the computer or whatever does stuff, then we get an output. The mechanism basically gets us from point A to point B, is kind of the way you can think about it. Um, and in most cases, this is based on theory. So again, you see the same kind of like figure I've been using, independent variable relating to the dependent variable. Mechanism is what's going on in the middle. What gets us from, again, point A to point B. Example of that. Another thing we've talked about, deterrence theory, right? Basic idea, people do this kind of cost-benefit calculation and then decide to offend or not offend is kind of the basic idea. So <clears throat> here, independent variable in that top one, risk of punishment is, re 